Coming up on Digital Music Trends 183, recorded on the 14th of May 2014, the angles on a potential Beats acquisition by Apple, a chat with the CEO of Yonder, Apex Twins Kickstarter, an interview with the CEO of Dubset, anti-piracy measures in Sweden, France and the UK, Spotify's reported bid for Last.fm before they acquired the Econest, and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available as an audio and video show on a variety of channels including the iTunes Store, most podcasting apps, if you're on, on iOS the podcast app is free or try out Downcast or Dogcatcher if you're on Android, uh, of course YouTube for the video version, SoundCloud, MixCloud, TuneIn and much more and if you'd like to receive a weekly mail out from DMT on the latest show so you don't miss any uh, the shortcut is a bit.ly slash dmt list and if you want to comment on anything that's happening during the show while you listen to it you can tweet me on at digimusictrans or email contact at digitalmusictrans.com uh, welcome any feedback of any kind and so uh, this week it's a real pleasure to welcome back uh, to the show lucy blair so uh, just uh, come back from spot so hi lucy how's it going Hi, Andrea. Very good, thanks. Uh, good to be back. <laughs> it's great to have you. And uh, uh, Darren Hemmings. So hi, Darren. How's it going? Good. All lovely. And Darren, of course, from uh, uh, Motive Unknown and also known for the Daily Digest, which you can subscribe to on MotiveUnknown.com, which is a great uh, roundup of everything that's happening every day in the music industry and also in the sort of digital marketing side of things, if I'm correct. Yes. Am I correct? Yeah, that pretty okay, much nails great. it. I'll awesome. give you that one. Awesome. You've earned your tenor. Well done. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and no money is changing hands. I, I, I would like to stress that. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and so uh, this week, uh, we're going to have a couple of uh, guests coming on. I've got a pre-recorded interview as well. But, uh, of course, the story that ruled them all this week, and uh, no, it's not the beginning of Lord of the Rings, but it's uh, Beats Electronics and uh, the supposed deal uh, that sees uh, uh, Beats being acquired by Apple. So it's, uh, it was big news this week. It came out on, fr on Thursday, uh, about midnight, actually. I was in a hotel at The Great Escape uh, when I read the news, and then I started spreading it around, uh, like the good... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> busybody that I am and uh, um, and yeah so we have we have heard essentially uh everything every single angle around the story ever since you know there's been hundreds of articles uh, written seems like everybody that has any connection to music or tech or hardware or anything like that has written a post uh, about the apple and beats music story so uh, definitely uh, it's it's an interesting one uh, but uh, uh, i wanted to hear your opinion and uh, uh, you know in case you haven't heard about it uh, apple uh, would be acquiring according to the reports of the financial times uh, uh, beats music and beats electronics for 3.2 billion dollars uh, this seemed to be confirmed in a video uploaded by dre dr dre over the weekend uh, where he seemed to sort of boast about the fact that this was happening although no official statement has been made at this point by either company so uh, it's, it's essentially still a fairly weighty rumor but we're not sure this is happening still yet uh, and i wanted to tackle it from three different angles uh, so uh, the hardware side the service side with beats music and then generally what it means for the brand apple so uh, starting on, on the hardware side uh, Beats sells a massive amount of headphones so this is not a stupid move on apple's part you know that they do make a lot of money um, but interesting to see whether Apple could apply Beats Music uh, into uh, their own technology and what they're developing for the headphone side of things and the wearable side of things so uh, uh, Darren do you think that uh, there is something there that Apple could actually tap into the pre-designed uh, range of headphones that Beats has already made uh, and without having to, to spend all the money on R&D and actually integrate some of the uh, tech elements that they developed for the wearable side of things into those headphones and make them even more appealing to the mainstream uh, it's certainly possible, yeah. I, I find it a bit odd. I mean, there's a sort of degree to which, um, you know, they're, they're, I think it was on, was it on Malik? Somebody was writing about it and saying that they've outsourced the uh, the whole thing when they designed right. the Beats headphones. They were outsourced to a guy that used to work for Johnny Ive anyway. Um, so it's quite funny that they're sort of now buying a company that's designed products uh, by a man, you know, who used to work under the chief designer at Apple. There's a sort of strange, circuitous thing about that. Um, it's a bit puzzling, really, isn't it? I think it's probably yeah. the best way of summing this one up. Absolutely. It's a bit peculiar. Uh, you know, I think Beats are sort of, in Beats world, they're known for, like, you know, amazing quality headphones and all that sort of thing. I think to everyone else, they seem to be, among, certainly among the more cynical members of the public, they're sort of known for uh, being somewhat looks-over, you know, style-over-substance, I guess. Um, 
which isn't really Apple's thing, it has to be said. They're not yeah. really a kind of, they don't do that. They're very proud of their high quality on their products and, you know, and all that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's, I think the, the reason we're seeing so much speculation in general is just that people are probably a bit puzzled as to the move. You know, it's, I think often, it's like, you know, when Spotify buys Echo Nest, it's such a no-brainer that it doesn't really warrant any discussion. There's, yeah. there's nothing to discuss. It's kind of plainly obvious why they'd buy that company. But when you're talking about uh, this kind of move, I think most people are just a bit, bit bewildered. You know, Apple do design, clearly. They've, you know, they led the consumer market for high design products. Uh, so they don't, you know, they could certainly do this themselves. Um, so I don't know. I mean, you know, I think I have to say, you know, my gut feeling on the whole just seems to be that maybe this is more of like, the, you know, the world's most expensive kind of acquire or however we term it when, the, you know, that I think the money is as much for Dre and Iovine and, and co as it is for uh, any other aspect of the business. Because yeah. I don't think there's, there's much else that Apple couldn't replicate themselves, you know, a streaming service is not beyond this company, yeah. and neither is a headphones business. But uh, So it's, it's curious, it's puzzling. Lucy, on, on the hardware side, do you, are, are, do you think that there's something there in terms of integration? And uh, uh, you know, do you think it makes sense for Apple to buy a company for this valuation that also has a business that makes money and you know, is, is already a, a cash, has a cash flow behind it, right? Yeah, um, I do. I mean, from that perspective, you know, the the hardware business kind of paying for the stream music service, you know, you can see that uh, that would kind of make sense for Apple. Um, I think one of the interesting aspects that um, has been written about over the past few days is is how this might sort of this acquisition assuming that it does go ahead uh, might transform the rest of the industry right. um you know there was another good article on um gigarom saying that you know we might get to a point where actually all of the big uh, tech companies are going to own a streaming service or are going to purchase one and then you know pure play music subscription services won't actually be able to compete anymore they won't exist anymore um, and instead we'll be in a very different scenario where you know music services are being bundled with you know hardware with amazon prime with headphones you know with, with anything else under the sun really yeah. um, and and the music subscription subscription st streaming setup that we know today actually isn't going to exist anymore yeah. Um, so I think that that's actually one of the most uh, interesting possible impacts of the whole uh, purchase, assuming that it does go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and, uh, and it, it could be an interesting evolution of, of the digital music uh, side of things. But at the same time, mm. it kind of it, 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 uh, when we talk about the streaming service, which is Beats Music, it does ma make me wonder. You know, I've seen a couple of articles already that are stressing the fact that uh, people that are interested in Beats should look elsewhere at this point and should look at something like Spotify if they want a service that they are absolutely certain, cr crystal clear that is going to be here uh, in a year or two years' time. Uh, whilst Beats, mu Beats Music now, it's it's a bit of a question mark because if the acquisition goes ahead, we don't. Know what Apple's going to do with it. So, uh, you know, Darren, do you think that uh, Beats can fit within Apple as a streaming service, or does it make a lot more sense for Apple to just, you know, start from scratch? I mean, the other question mark is around licenses. We don't know whether Apple can actually continue operating the service under the licenses that Beats has struck with the labels, or whether those are going to have to be renegotiated as soon as the acquisition goes through. So, lots and lots of question marks here, and then I guess a bit of uncertainty for for Beats music consumers. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the license thing I, I've seen and heard kind of, you know, people calling that both ways, that right. the licenses are transferable and things like that. I mean, I think, to be honest, in my experience, the music business are not in the sort of, you know, they're not in the business of being vindictive around licensing in that sense that, you know, they're not going to sit and go, oh, what, you want to renew? Well, you can get lost, <laughs> you know. Um, they might just seek to get more money out of it. And, you know, certainly the the years of iTunes playing hardball on stuff might, might come around to bite them on the backside. But um, I don't think it would be crazy. You know, the, the music industry is still not stupid. And, right. you know, and I think that's the easy thing to forget is, you know, it's kind of as Lucy said, you know, there's a, a phenomenal power for these people to take a service like Beats and bundle it into iPhones and everything else, you know, that, that Apple makes, and suddenly you have a pretty strong proposition. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, relative to Beats model and where that leaves them, you know, would people rush to sign up? I don't really know. I mean, I, I still maintain the number one flaw in Beats plan was that they just didn't have a free tier. Right. You know, if you can sign up for Spotify and get it for free with ads and same with audio... Um, 
and maybe Deezer, I forget, to be honest. Uh, then, you know, in the face of that sort of seven days free use and then trying to chase people for, a, a you know, a 10 or $15 subscription is um, just, you know, it doesn't add up, does it? People yeah. are just going to take one look and sort of say, well, you know, as, as everyone's constantly remarked, you know, these services are largely homogenous bar a few discovery bits thrown in and stuff like that um and but certainly to the degree where you know if it's ten dollars a month on beats or nothing for spotify and you put up with some ads then uh, i would imagine a lot of people will plump for the former but yeah i mean you know i think something that others have remarked is that this is this is all just manna from heaven for, for spotify you know it, <laughs> it thrusts the whole streaming music debate right to the fore right you know it, it drives a lot of people back their way because of people questioning whether beats are the ones to go for, you know, it's, it's a, it's a total gift. I mean, if I was Spotify, I'd just be running around doing high fives all the time now. Yeah. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I suspect, you know, we'll see, but I think around this, it, it, Spotify probably shouldn't get too comfortable because, you know, again, going back to Lucy's point, I think we're still the, 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 the question that's not been answered is the degree to which, uh, streaming services can just be tossed in with something else you're paying for. Yeah. Whether that's an iPhone or something a, a little bit more straightforward, kind of like Amazon Prime, um, you know, where they're trying to bundle in video now. So originally we were all signing up because it meant free postage, whereas now it's sort of free postage and, uh, and free video service. And, you know, if they bundle music into that as well, then that would be a pretty aggressive move to yeah. the man in the street. And, you know, I think Every time I'm on here, I seem to repeat that mantra, but it's kind of like, you know, we in the music industry tend to look at ourselves and our, our terribly snobbish ways when I think, you know, the other 95% of the population that you're trying to capture on this are probably more likely to go in for bundled services and things because yeah. it's just very painless and it, it reaches that point of sort of music as a you know, as, a, as an amenity service in the same manner as electricity and stuff, you know. Yeah. And Lucy, uh, from, from your side, you worked at labels as well, uh, you know, Minister of Sound and Anjuna Beat. So uh, from, from with that hat on, uh, how scared do you think labels are of uh, potentially seeing iTunes move away from downloads and into streaming? And how do you think that that transition can be, you know, everybody's wondering how will Apple handle that transition, which is going to come at some point, but could really leave a gaping hole in the music industry's revenues if, if it happens too quickly? Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, it, it is something for all of us to worry about, I think, in the music industry, not just from the label side, but for everybody's side. Um, you know, Mark Mulligan's written some, some very good pieces about this, that, you know, the, the decline in CD sales uh, and download sales is not being uh, covered sufficiently by streaming at the moment, that there is a big gap. And just as you said just now, if this happens too fast, you know, we're, we're all going to be in a lot of trouble yeah. um, because streaming as is, is a model, you know, is still not proven. I remember, um, you know, Chris Cook at, from CMU was, was talking about this at The Great Escape last week as well and saying, you know, while there's every reason for optimism at the same time, we all have to be cautious because about stream is a model because the long-term efficacy you know it isn't proven and, and no yeah. one knows if, it, if it's going to be viable long term and if it is in, in what format whether that's you know continuous pure play music services or as we we're just talking about whether it it ends up being that in order to really convert the mainstream consumer to to music streaming they do, you know the big tech giants of the world do end up buying off all the mu music streaming services and it does end up getting bundled in with you know your amazon prime and, and yeah. your, everything else um so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we are facing a difficult time, you know, in, in the sense of the, the transition between CDs and downloads uh, to streaming and, and how that's going to go. And, and no one really has any answers as yet, yeah. um, <laughs> at least for me, clearly. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how, how that all plays out o over the next year or two. And I think if... If Apple do buy Beats, that really is going to, you know, put the cat amongst the pigeons pretty quickly. And I, I think that could actually set off a chain reaction of, of, you know, reactions from the other streaming services. And then we may find ourselves in 12 years time in a situation that's completely different where the music industry has moved very, very fast yeah. from where we are now to potentially a completely different scenario in 12 months time. Um, 
from the label side, I guess, as well, we always have to consider, you know, the point you were talking about, Andrea, before about the licenses. You know, no one knows whether Apple's going to have to renegotiate the licenses if the purchase does go ahead. We're all assuming that they probably will, um, you know, and, and then it's a case of, you know, how much do, do the major labels want to support Apple yeah. um, in the industry? I think Darren actually raised this point in, in the Daily, daily Digest Um a few days ago, and of course, UMG have have a huge stake and are set to cash out to a tune of what what was it four hundred forty two million, I think, if the sale does go yeah. ahead. Um, so that that's another very interesting point to consider when we talk about labels and you know this possible acquisition of, between Apple and Beats. Um, that's you know, exciting. When it, when it, that's exciting. It's the first time we're going to see like a payout to a major label from a streaming service. Yeah, and um, yes, let punch up begin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I think uh, Dar Darren raised a really good point about this in, in the digest again that um, you know that might all reignite the whole debate about you know well okay UMG are benefiting to the tune of nearly four hundred and fifty million. So you know where's the actual benefit from that coming to the artist? You know, is that going to trickle down and you know to the artists to the labels, um, primarily the artists, of course, and then you know, that this could all kick off that, that debate again about how much artists are actually benefiting from the streaming model. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure this will come up. The first time there's a big payout, this will come up right away. <laughs> yeah. This, this is going to have to be like a big artist that decides that they are mm -hmm. owed you know, 2% of that amount and they're going to start a fight about it. But uh, we'll, yeah. we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, I guess. <laughs> so it's a real pleasure to welcome Adam Kidron, the CEO of Yonder. So hi, Adam. Thanks for joining us. How's it going? everything's fun here in new york it's great to have you and so essentially you know i just wanted to bring you on the show to chat about uh, the company i read a piece on the new york times uh, today about it uh, uh, that was written by ben cesario so i just wanted to sort of check in and see what's going on at the company so what is yonder all about what we're doing is we're uh, we're introducing a new music model which we think should become a new category um in the marketplace, um, at, you know, as you know, there's a great deal of hope at the moment on streaming services, uh, paid for monthly uh, streaming services. And we're of a view that there shouldn't be so much hope about paid for monthly streaming services because by any measure, uh, they only appeal to a subset of a very small market, the people who want to pay for music. And uh, we calculate that that market is about 1% of Global, global mobile users. So if you take Spotify with maybe 7 million paid subscribers, if you count all the people on the free month, Deezer um, with maybe 5 million, Beats we now know has a princely 117,000. And uh, um, you add them all up, it comes to about 20 million paid music subscribers in the world. Right. And there's 2 billion people on smart devices. So the question is, who's going to appeal to the other 99%? Sure. And so, and, uh, sorry. And so in, in that sense, you're, you're looking at a sort of a, what, what is called a hard bundle, right? We're bundling the music with a, with a phone? With a phone or with service, yes. So okay. um, the basic proposition for the consumer is they buy the device they want, they take the service they want, and music and the cost of music is embedded in it. And because we're um, accessing consumers by the tens of thousands rather than individually, we're able to do it at prices that are almost invisible to consumers. Right. And so uh, what kind of what uh, led you to this decision? And was the, the starting up uh, this new venture sort of informed by the experience you had with uh, uh, Beyond the Blue as well? Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, Beyond Oblivion experience was informed by a royalty statement I got for a record in 19, uh, 2007 called This Is Why I'm Hot, which was the number one record in America. And I got a royalty statement for a few thousand dollars um, for it. And I realized that the model, the paid down, download model wasn't going to work because it wasn't going to throw off enough revenues to build a, a, a healthy uh, music industry. So we started Beyond Oblivion, but we started Beyond Oblivion at a difficult time. The record companies were quite resistant to it, wanted very high advances. Um, now, uh, four years later, faced with a very discouraging curve of iTunes revenues and a very even more discouraging uh, curve of uh, paid subscription revenues, um, you know, it's much easier with the record companies because they realize that at least our, our 
service isn't going to cannibalize their existing revenues. Yeah. Absolutely. And so we haven't seen much in the way of hard bundles uh, since uh, uh, really Nokia come, comes, comes with music. And so what are you doing differently uh, for, to Nokia that sort of uh, encourages you to, to take this path? Well, first of all, I think that uh, comes with music was about 85 percent right. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a it was a it was a wonderful example of a great idea sort of ruined in its execution. And I've had a couple of those, so I know how difficult it really is. So I remember going to Carphone Warehouse when uh, Comes With Music came out, and I was really excited. So I said to the salesperson, so how does this work? And the, the lady in the store says, well, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think you get music free for the first year, and you can only get it on this one device. And she showed me this device, and it was nothing anybody would want to ever buy. And um, and she said, and at the end of the first year, I'm not really sure what happens. I think you have to pay for it, but I'm not really, really sure. So the issue with Comes With Music was it was a hugely uh, confused marketing message. It was on some really crap phones. And it was at a time where smartphone penetration was actually very, very low. So it was before its time. The other thing is that Nokia had negotiated some really horrendous deals with the music labels that made Comes With Music very, very expensive right. uh, for Nokia. So I think it's just a question of time. You know, uh, I wish I could show you the application. In fact, uh, we should have uh, done this with an Android mirror so we could show you the application because the application right. itself is very, very, very um, elegant. That's awesome, yeah, and, and hopefully maybe uh, we can arrange to have you back on the show to do a one-to-one -one show, and I can actually do live demos uh, via Skype of, of applications, so that's that's definitely something I'd like to do at some point. Do you have any questions for uh, for Adam before I let him go? Um, Adam, I'm curious, with the, with the, you know, the, the current model as it stands, you know, do you, you know, the... the I mean, you know, who are your, your sort of primary targets in terms of partnerships across mobiles then with these devices? Am I understanding you right that, you know, you will partner with current handset manufacturers to be offering this as a complete uh, bundled service? Yeah, um, but I think that as you look globally, especially in developing markets, you're looking more, mostly at actually network operators um, because they have huge audiences and they can just deploy um, it as you want. So hard bundled with service, especially in prepaid low ARPU markets, is probably the way to go. And you'll see some very exciting um, uh, announcements from us especially in Africa, Latin America, and um, developing markets in Asia, um, all within the next two or three months. We expect to go to market in Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, Botswana, Angola, um, all in between August and September um, of this year. And so, um, yes, manufacturers are a target, uh, but and eventually um, we'll probably have our own branded devices but the truth of the matter is that the, uh, the real tonnage is in network operas, operators, especially network operators in developing markets. Right, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Lucy, do you have any, anything to ask? Or? Yeah, I mean, you touched on marketing just now, Adam, and, and how Nokia were doing it. And you said that you want to attract sort of the 98% of the market who aren't currently paying for music. Um, so I'm just interested to know what your marketing plans are to kind of help you achieve that goal. Well, um, as somebody who's sort of been a bit obsessed by marketing his entire life, um, in this particular case, um, the marketing we're doing is going to be mostly in network. So what we're going to be doing is um, going with networks that say, look, you know, um, our network sounds better with unlimited music from um, Nokia or manufacturers that say our device sounds better or unlock unlimited music um, on your device. So we'll be working with manufacturers who want to show off the capability of their um, of their devices, whether it's stereo speakers or compression or it's the capacity or uh, a network that's just upgraded to 4G, has limited spectrum, wants a progressive download model because they can serve most of the files locally instead of over the air. You know, so um, uh, we'll be doing marketing, but we'll be doing marketing to people who 
mostly have already got the application. So this is a distribution play. You put the application on the handset. You tell people it's the best way of accessing music. You get incredibly high activation rates. And so the marketing is to people already have the application on the device because what you're trying to do always is prove the value of the hard bundle. So it's a bit of a different proposition. That said, on the 20th of uh, on the 20th of this month, we're going to have a lot of fun in New York City. And um, I'm sure you'll hear about it in um, London because we're going to do something very flash and very, very nice. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> nice. Sounds cool. intriguing. <laughs> Adam, that's great. Uh, thanks so much for your time. And uh, what is the website for the company if people want to go and check it out? Uh, www.yondermusic.com. That's perfect. And uh, thanks so much for your time. And I, I look forward to hearing more about it in, in, the, in the next few months. I know it's uh, still early stage. And uh, thanks again to Adam for uh, chipping in with uh, the latest from uh, Yonder. And uh, now I want to talk about Kickstarter. And so I want to talk about the Aphex Twin uh, campaign and just to finish this. So uh, the, it was a Kickstarter that was deemed as a once in a lifetime chance to own Aphex Twin's uh, unreleased album Caustic Window. Uh, the campaign uh, closed having raised uh, 66 seven thousand four hundred twenty four dollars pledged by four thousand one hundred twenty four backers who paid each sixteen dollars each to receive a digital copy of the album so uh, you know a, a pretty respectable amount there and caustic windows uh, caustic window was Aphex twins uh, first release from 1994 but it never really uh, saw the light of day uh, and uh, only four people in the world apparently owned the test pressings of the album so all of them had sworn and never to release it and uh, when a copy turned up on eBay uh, a fan of uh, Aphex Twin, uh, James E. Thomas, who heads up the site We Are The Music Makers, thought it could be possible to buy it and then convince the label to license it to them for this limited edition run. Uh, the cool thing is that it won't go on sale to the general public after this uh, Kickstarter. It will just be distributed digitally to those uh, 4,124 people and then that will be that unless somebody puts it on a torrent, of course, which you know, uh, if they have pledged, it's uh, less likely, I guess, because they'll feel some sort of ownership toward the, towards the album and uh, exclusivity. So uh, that's I, w I wanted to address this story sort of from the angle of uh, how it uh, helps uh, releases that have never seen the light of day or that have not been released or catalog releases uh, come back to light uh, thanks to crowdfunding. So Lucy, do you think that there's there's a big play there? And I know that Pledge, for example, have set up their, their catalog division to, to take care of just these projects. But uh, uh, do you think it's still relatively under represented and that it's, it's kind of funny that fans are taking the lead in and doing something like this. Yeah, I think um, it's particularly applicable for obviously catalog releases and for artists who already have, you know, a big fan base. Um, in the case of Aphex Twin, I mean, obviously it's, it's it made even more enticing, I guess, by the fact that, you know, it is so exclusive. It was their very first recording. Um, only those four people in the world ever had a copy um, and, it, and it's not being put on general sale afterwards. Um, and, you know, you tend to find on most Kickstarter campaigns, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, most of them don't have that much kind of excitement around it. They're not so exclusive, you know, they right. will be going to general sale at some point or, you know, it, it, it's not as enticing as this particular one. So I can see why it's done so well. And I think in addition, probably the fact that Aphex Twin isn't exactly the kind of artist to be on Facebook, you know, or Instagram showing you what, what he had for his breakfast every day, you know, yeah. <laughs> that I think that kind of lack of, of access actually to the artist probably helps uh, in this particular case to make it even more exclusive even more exciting if you're a fan of Aphex Twin because you know you really can't get this kind of content it really is a, a complete one-off um and that's very, very exciting. Um, you know, I think there's definitely a, a, a time and a place for catalog releases on Kickstarter. Um, you know, if you're an established artist and you already have, you know, a big fan base and there's enough of demand for it, you know, then great. And of course, uh, find out if there is enough of demand for it, you know, Kickstarter and, and Pledge Music, et cetera, is, is the best way to do that. Um, so, so that's great. Of course, it's not going to work so well if you're an established artist but for a catalog campaign yeah it can be very effective absolutely and, and mm -hmm. there's still a lot of labels that sort of survive, the smaller labels that survive by finding those hidden gems in the Universal Music's catalog or uh, Warner's catalog, going to the archives uh, and uh, asking for a permission to license those recordings and release them to a public that they know is going to be willing to buy them, uh, mm -hmm. whilst Universal Music might not have a financial reason really to, uh, to, do, to do that. And so, you know, at least if they license it, they mm -hmm. get a bit of money off the, off the release and these, and these other independent smaller labels are able to actually put the albums out. So... Uh, 
Uh, Darren, do you, mm. do you think this is going to be something that we're going to see more of uh, from a crowdfunding perspective rather than an actual label that is curating this? Um, not really, to be honest. I don't know. I mean, you know, I think as Lucy said, you know, it's Aphex Twin. It's his first release. Aphex Twin fans are fucking mental. I mean, they, you know, someone got buried with his back catalogue for crying out loud. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like uh, that's a that's a next level brand maniac fan. Right. Um, and, you know, yeah, I just think he, he, there's a long history of these things happening, isn't there, where someone does, you know, the, something that's different, uh, innovative, whatever, you know, like Radiohead and the Hole in Rainbow stuff and everything else. It doesn't really set a precedent for people doing it. And the minute someone else does it, it kind of fairly instantly loses its uh, kind of gloss, you know, as, yeah. as, a, as a proposition. I mean, and I, I think this one's pretty kind of unique on a number of levels i mean that you know they are you know maniac fans which obviously helps a lot uh you know i think apex twin it kind of suits apex twin to do it this way you know it plays well to his whole mysterious vibe you know mm -hmm. about the only other artist i could think of that would probably pull this off is something like the klf right um and then they'll probably just burn the money afterwards uh, <laughs> yeah. but, you know it's, it's sort of it's just not uh, uh you know i don't think it really is is something to read a great deal into really yeah. it's yeah. you know it's, it's you know, incredibly rare circumstance as well like i don't think there's probably yeah. uh, you can't probably count on the on the palm of your hands the bands that have that unreleased album that has never seen the light of day Yes, yeah, you can't often. replicate that scenario for your your average artist, I don't think, no. you know, as, as we've all said. I think it's a really nice way of kind of super serving fans when you have an extreme case scenario like this one. But as Darren was saying, you know, I wouldn't want to see, you know, loads of labels and artists trying to jump on this bandwagon and, and just do it because it's the next big thing. Yeah. You know, it, it's not, or at least I hope it's not. Um, you know, it, it's a great way to super serve the fans for the right artist at the right time with the right release but you know I, I hope it kind of stays that way and people don't try and jump on the back of it <laughs> and you do see in catalogue releases now that people are picking a straws these days because uh, sometimes they've already had a one great you know one re-release of that a particular classic album come out and now they just don't know what to do like uh, I, I, I'm a big Elton John fan. I'm sure I've been pretty vocal about it before, so I'm not too ashamed about it. But I got I got the release of Goodbye Yellowbrick Road uh, last month, and uh, amazing, you know, remaster, all great. But it had already been remastered, so it was kind of like beyond the point. Uh, but it had all these covers made by bands of all kinds of, of, of all walks of life and literally like 95% of them are terrible covers uh, and it's just you know you feel like the label had the pressure of adding something to the to the package in order to make it more appealing but yeah mm -hmm. it was just wasn't a very good kind of cries out for the goodbye yellow shit road headline really yeah, doesn't it exactly <laughs> <Sorry>. unfortunately <laughs> that that was it i, I, I was very optimistic i started yeah. listening to the covers with a very open heart and thinking oh maybe they did something fantastic no it didn't uh, so yeah it, that's the kind of thing that unfortunately happens a lot with catalog because people are trying to mm. add value uh there's a good market for this stuff i mean you know i think soul jazz and other labels have done you know and trunk and finders keepers have done an amazing job of digging up you know totally bizarre lost gems and you know the william onyabor is probably a great example where luca bop have you know pulled out this record by this guy that now every bloody hip artist on the planet is raving about and right you know i've had like three separate friends mainly going oh my god have you heard this and you know this is an old this is this is someone who's been around years you know this music is decades old now so you know it's kind of proof that there's always good stuff to pull up and, and what's there to pull up and how applicable it is changes with culture and movement of the times. But, yeah. I mean, you know, on the flip side, Jimmy Page remastering the sodding Led Zeppelin catalogue for, I mean, no joke, it's what, the third or fourth time? I mean, it's just an insult to everybody involved. And, you know, that that needs to stop. Yes. You know, that's, that's muckraking in the extreme and... You know, as, as with your Elton John example, you know, as you say, it's kind of like they're now troweling up songs going, you know, here's something that was never released. And normally it's kind of could be suffixed with yes, for a good reason, because it's yeah. shite. Yeah. So, uh, yes. It's it, one of those you know. things.
But, Leave uh, those things fine. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to take another short break now. At this point, uh, with a, uh, we're going to have a five-minute extract of the interview I recorded yesterday with uh, Bob Barbieri, who is the CEO of Dubset. If you tuned into last week's show recorded at The Great Escape, we actually talked about Dubset and the fact that they just closed a new B round led by Rhapsody. So the full interview uh, will be live on the one-to-one show this week. So if you want to tune into that, uh, uh, please do on digitalmusictrends.com. Otherwise, here is five minutes uh, on what the company is all about and uh, why Rhapsody got involved. So hi, Bob. Thanks for joining me on the show today. How's it going? It's going terrific. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great to have you. So, uh, of course, uh, last week uh, we uh, covered uh, uh, during the DMT at the Live at the Great Escape uh, uh, the investment round, uh, the B in, uh, round investment led by Rhapsody. So uh, it would be fantastic if you could start by introducing Dubset as a company uh, to our listeners. Sure. Dubset was founded in 2009 and is a music technology company. Um, The basis of the company is founded in developing technologies that resolve the rights in complex um, music content. Complex music content most often described as mixed content in the DJ world. So uh, the sweet spot for this company is taking essentially a one-hour mixtape, live performance, um, radio show, podcast that contains um, 10, 20, 30 different samples of music, um, processing that, registering it. So we've, we created this global registry. Um, once we register and process it through our partnership with GraceNote, we identify all the way down into three-second inter- uh, audio files what's being played in each three-second audio file. Um, We then reassemble that into what we call a mixed DNA. Um, Once we have a mixed DNA, that piece of content can now be shared globally with consumers with data coming back from the distributor as to all of the listener data points. Here's where they started, here's where they stopped, here's where they restarted, fast forward, rewind, and so forth. And because we've parsed these down into three-second audio files, we can in a very granular and precise way provide back exactly what sample tracks in that mix were listened to. uh, Last week we were talking about the fact that, you know, the company has got both, uh, of course, a back-end side of it and a front-end, of course, the front-end being the future uh, FM and the back-end being those uh, uh, royalty recognition technologies that you just talked about. And so how much uh, uh, focus is there from the company on on the front-end versus the back-end or do those two sort of go along on a parallel path? You know, it's a great question. We've put a lot of our energy into the consumer-facing side, the future.fm, simply because we needed to have that in order to build what we call MixBank, which is our artist-facing uh, platform, right. and MixScan, the underlying technology. So we built out this consumer platform. We just launched on May 6th, as you probably have seen, a new UI UX on the web, the new iOS uh, version is coming out in about a week and a half. Um, but we've invested a lot into that and into the mix scan technology that underlies the, the rights and, and resolution points. Um, moving forward, you're going to see more of our development going into MixBank and continue into MixScan. Because the future.fm essentially is finished in our in our world. Um, the DSPs, the Rhapsodies, and other folks have the opportunity to use that as a turnkey platform if they want to put it adjacent or within their service, or they can just offer the music out of their own library. Yeah. Um, as if we were provide the future.fm is almost more of a label to them and just providing 100,000 hours of new content to them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, we had a statement from uh, Rhapsody that said, you know, that their, the investment that they had in this uh, new round of funding uh, sort of demonstrates uh, the commitment of the company uh, to EDM. So in that sense, do, do, do you feel like uh, uh, they were interested in the uh, uh, in the back end side of things in the future of FM? You know, last week, we're, my panelists were talking about the fact that it would be very cool for Rhapsody to be able to integrate some of the content you have on the future uh, onto Rhapsody itself. And, and so what, what do you think the interest stemmed from? Well, you know, Rhapsody is an interesting company, Andrea. They um, they've gone through a lot of changes over the last year for the for the better. Yeah. Um, as you know, they operate under Napster almost everywhere except for the U.S. Um, and they have built some amazing partnerships and relationships with mobile operators like Telefonica and others. And they're arguably now one of the fastest, probably with Spotify, the two fastest growing music services. In the world, so they're sort of stepping out of their comfort zone, and this investment in in us 
was, as you saw, first for them. Um, we're working closely with their team. The, the, the interesting part of the business for us is, and I come from a technology world where I build these sort of neutral platforms that solve marketplace inefficiencies. Um, there's already been some questions about neutrality with a Rhapsody investment. So A, it's a, it's a minority investment. Um, B, it was a great investment from our part because now what's the natural extension? Once you have the future.fm all figured out, the natural extension is, okay, now start plugging in music services. Yeah. So the Rhapsody yeah. service is in the process of plugging in. There's definitely a commitment on their part, Andrea, into EDM dance. And, and EDM is much, as you know, much broader than just electronic, right? We have a, a massive amount of pop top 40 mixes that I don't know if the – EDM folks would even want classified as EDM. Right. Um, but all of that content is very interesting. We have country mixes that are real interesting. And what I think Rhapsody sees and other music services, we're in discussions or various level of integrations with about 10 other music services right now. Um, what they see is this is an amazing discovery vehicle for music. Right. So you get a mix curated by a top DJ in the world. Within that, you you hear a track that may be new to you or something that you really like, particularly the way it's mixed. You can click on a button and basically put that individual track into your Rhapsody playlist or into your Rhapsody um, music library. And that's what's exciting to those folks. And thanks so much for your time, Bob, today. It was great having you. Uh, thank you so much. It was a, a pleasure joining you. And again, uh, check out uh, dubsat.com for the main company's website and also check out thefuture.fm for the more consumer-facing uh, part of the company. And uh, and this week we had an avalanche of piracy-related stories, uh, but they're not as yawn-inducing as you might think, so stick with us. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank actually Torrent Freak a lot for all the insights on these new developments because most of the articles I'm drawing these from are from Torrent Freak. And so first up, Lucy, we're going to talk about Sweden. So uh, uh, it's it's your part of the world, and uh, uh, I've seen a new study uh, that uh, talks about the effects of the iPred anti-piracy law. You can actually download it if you're interested at home. It's a 21-page document and quite academic, and that is quite yawn-inducing. So you have to have a quite a strong stomach to read through all those 21 pages. Uh, the law, uh, the iPred law, gives the rights holders the authority to request the personal details of alleged uh, copyright infringers, and has been in place for five years now. The researchers write uh, as a summary that uh, we find the reform decreased internet traffic by 16% and increased music sales by 36% during the first six, six months. Uh, pirated music, therefore, seems to be a strong substitute f uh, to legal music in that sense. But they also write that the deterrent effect decreased quickly, possibly because of the few and slow legal processes. Uh, uh, the law enforcement through convictions, therefore, seems to be a necessary ingredient for the long-run success of a copyright protection law. So this is a very interesting take on the whole process, because we've been used to hearing about the failures of projects like Hado P, for example, in France, and they pulled the plug on the on the three strikes uh, uh, in the middle of last year because it wasn't working. And so, uh, hearing that it actually worked in Sweden as a deterrent is kind of uh, interesting. So, Lucy, what are your thoughts on that? And, and do, you, do you think that that could have been a, a reason why, for example, Spotify did so well? Uh, possibly. Um, I mean, I have to confess, I haven't read the, the, the through the twenty-one pages. No, I can't lie. <laughs> me neither. Um, I've only honest, read yeah. the uh, the Torrent Freak piece, <laughs> I uh, read it. which is is sort of summarising it. Um, you know, clearly that's my bedtime reading for tonight. Is these twenty-one pages? <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, it's hard to say to be honest without reading the full report. Um, it's the the, the Torrent Freak articles kind of say. Uh, literally as soon as, you know, the day that this law came into effect, then, you know, internet traffic dropped hugely, um, you know, piracy, um, you know, there was a significant drop um, in internet traffic and, and it improved music sales and et cetera, et cetera. But there's no, um, they don't kind of factor into to this piece kind of, you know, the effect on streaming and, you know, yeah. Spotify um, in, in particular, I think have, have done some, some good PR around that, you know, how much their service has done, you know, to improve uh, piracy and, and, and you know, to a certain extent, get rid of it, you know, in countries like Sweden and Norway when it comes to music. Yeah. Um, but uh, this article is kind of, it, it's just giving a very incomplete 
picture yeah. I find and I'm, I'm just really I'm slightly dubious to be honest about you know suddenly there being a huge drop in internet traffic on the same day that came into effect because you know I mean most of the time you know reading the the other torrent free pieces around kind of Hadopi and, and the plans for the UK to to bring in new uh new laws um you know they, they <laughs> They're just not very effective usually, I find, these exactly, laws. I mean, yeah. certainly the, in, in deterring people because, you know, just reading the plans for the UK, you know, you're going to get four warnings. Um, after four warnings, you're not going to get another one and basically no action is really going to be taken. So, <laughs> you know, how much of a deterrent can that possibly be, you know? And um, I have to say, I think in Sweden, generally speaking, I'm going to brace myself for a load of abuse from angry <laughs> Swedes after this, but... Um, <laughs> To be honest, piracy is quite well ingrained here. Right. Um, and I, I would be very surprised about there being really a direct correlation between a law coming into effect on one day and a sudden huge drop in, in internet traffic on the same day because people think, oh, there's a new law just been passed. Okay, exactly. no, I won't download the new Game of Thrones, okay, Game of Thrones being aired five years ago, but you know what I mean. Yeah, um, sure. And I mean, that's exactly what I was going to ask. It was uh, culturally like, uh, there, it's not that different from the UK that people would actually literally you know, stop the presses and, and stop doing what they're doing because of your laws come into place. Yeah. Okay, right. No, really. I mean, in, piracy really is uh, pretty well ingrained here. I think in terms of music, it is fair to say that Spotify, uh, you know, and, and maybe to a lesser extent services, local services like Wimp, etc., have have done a lot um, to, to improve that situation. I think in terms of sort of downloading, you know, films, mu- um, TV shows, that kind of thing, particularly where you can't get popular shows like Game of Thrones and things, you know, uh, that's still quite... Uh, quite well ingrained i think yeah. in the in the <laughs> popular culture uh, in sweden and I, i'm very dubious about there being you know correlation between this law being passed and, and a sudden huge drop in in piracy and an increase in music sales i just don't think that 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 was the case i think i would love Spotify, to know if there was a Spotify, i think Spotify have done more than anyone else you know to yeah. to to sort out the the situation with with piracy here and and get much you know many many more people paying for music i think that's really what's improved over the last few years not not uh, that people have been d- deterred by this law to be honest <laughs> i wonder if the the people that have compiled the study have actually uh, got in touch with the uh, vpn providers and found a huge spike in the uh, vpn adoption by <laughs> swedes <laughs> Yeah, I'd be surprised, to be honest. I really would, because, of course, there is there is an availability issue here, uh, you know, in terms of not being able to get content that's readily available in the UK and, and the USA and things, and it is very frustrating. And, and, you know, a lot of the time people do have to resort to, you know, proxies and VPNs and things if you want to get international content. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that that is an issue, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, Darren, I want to ask you about the UK, because uh, there was another story in the UK, the fact that uh, the four biggest RSPs, are inclu- including Virgin Media, Talk, Talk, BT, and Sky are in talks with the content owners to start issuing letters to their customers if they are detecting the detected downloading uh, illegal or copyrighted content. So uh, this really strikes me as a, as a deja vu. I was kind of checking the calendar to see if I was uh, transported back to 2011 or 2012, but uh, I am in 2014. So I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, why now? It's you know at a time where it seems like hitting the wallets of pirates is really the way to go and trying to stop their advertising revenues. Uh, why would we start again with an expensive and uh, ineffective avenue of, of going and writing letters to consumers? Um, I mean, I, I, I find it hard not to be incredibly cynical and probably supply an answer to the tune of, you know, because the government are leaning on the ISPs and the ISPs need to tick a box right. that makes the government leave them alone. Um, you know, they've come under huge pressure. There's been a kind of do it or we'll legislate it type approach which the ISPs are probably not in favour of. But it's a bit ludicrous, really, isn't it? I mean, the, you know, the, 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 the sort of, you know, as Lucy said, it's like, you know, what, four letters and then they tell your mum? I mean, for crying out loud, you know, this is ridiculous. Um, and, you know, I think history, if it's taught us anything, has certainly taught us that, uh, you know, crackdowns on piracy just lead to developers really biting down on finding ways to circumvent the crackdown. So, uh, yeah. You know, there is always... Like pop, time. Yeah, you know, these things always come along that are just going to totally screw that up. So, yeah. 
Um, in that respect, I find it very hard to, to sort of believe that this is going to do anything at all. And it just raises this question. I mean, you know, Martin Mills touched on it, and you know, in this in this speech he did um, this week about you know cracking down on Google and, and the notion that sort of a takedown should be a stay down. And I think that's kind mm. of much more of a pertinent question than this kind of middle ground of ISPs mailing people sort of saying, "Hey, man, what you're doing is like totally wrong." And the guy just being like, yeah, I don't care. I knew that anyway. Like, we're not stupid. We know when we're pirating that you're downloading something illegally. It's just mm -hmm. we also know that the consequences of it are at best, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, evidently now, a, a harshly worded letter in a true yep. British style. <laughs> so um, uh, it feels more like people ticking boxes to make other people uh, feel that they're doing something. You know, I think if, if they were truly cracking down on things like this, the... ISPs that are currently the lesser ones that maybe don't uh, get all over this as much will suddenly find they get a surge on business because certainly mm. you know uh, it's the reason I switched from Plusnet to Zen for example was Plusnet kept shaping traffic and I whilst I'm not you know a, a huge consumer of pirated content it's kind of like I don't appreciate the notion that an ISP is going to dictate what traffic is uh, you know like primary traffic for me yeah. Um, and so I, I didn't like the way that they did that. So I moved to Zen where they don't have any traffic shaping or any of that stuff at all, you know. And, and so as a, as a consumer, it was my right to do that. And that's what I exercised, you know, my right, you know, then moved over. So uh, I just feel that if the ISPs were going to be that silly about it, all you'd see is people just going, well, all right, I'll, I'll be off over here then. Yeah. Um, so I, I just, the whole thing just smacks of being painfully ineffective and they're talking to the ISPs mm -hmm. when they need to really be talking to Google and, and the people that are the connective tissue here, not the conduit down which the pirate content flows. Yeah, and uh, you, you know, you, you touched upon uh, the speech that Martin Mills uh, did from the Baggers Group, and uh, uh, this was done at uh, Canadian Music Week, uh, and it's actually reproduced in full on musictechpolicy.wordpress.com. If uh, anybody in the audience wants to go and check it out, it's definitely worth a read. Uh, a couple of main uh, sort of takeouts from it is uh, essentially pointing out the abuse of the safe harbors and uh, the DMCA by companies like uh, uh, Google and YouTube. So interesting, actually, that. He he should use uh, YouTube and Grooveshark in the same sentence. That was uh, uh, quite, a, I guess, a, a disruptive uh, thing to do because, of course, uh, Grooveshark has got a lot of more issues than YouTube right now when it comes to uh, to uh, getting rights. Uh, uh, but, it, you know, he talked about the fact that there's an imbalance here uh, as to where the, the burden uh, lies uh, uh, on the DMCA point of view. And this kind of ties into uh, the uh, Hado P, which is the last piracy story that I was going to talk about. So uh, Hado P, of course, has been Stopped as a law itself, but the Hadopi agency still exists, and so they've compiled a report on a uh, developments tool uh, to deal with piracy. And uh, as, uh, one of those uh, uh, recommendations actually is altering the DMCA style process, which also happens in Europe, where our, our record labels would have to request for the takedown of the same tracks uh, millions of times uh, to, to the same uh, pr provider. And you know, in their eyes, uh, it should work, uh, in, and, and in the US, they would like that uh, to be changed as well. Uh, they would like to be able to, for example, take down Katy Perry's firework once, and that be that. And you know that you know YouTube, for example, or any or Groove Shark would be able to uh, just keep that track down without having to keep sending those uh, those, those notices. So. Um, and uh, uh, the Hadopi also made a couple of other recommendations, which was uh, creating a public list of shames of services that are infringing on copyright on a large scale. And also uh, they were talking about uh, hitting the uh, advertising side of things for pirate sites and restricting their access to advertising uh, um, inventory, essentially. Uh, so on that front, do you think that it is time? You know, We know that in the US uh, there is a, a copyright uh, reviewing process and the DMCA is going to be part of that conversation. Uh, how hard do you think uh, that there's going to be lobbies on both sides trying to get things uh, staying as they are or change uh, for the better for, for the for the uh, content industries uh, Lucy do you have any ideas to you know uh, well not any idea but can you can you picture what kind of words are going on at the back of <laughs> mm, I don't know if I want to to be honest <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to get quite ugly quite fast exactly um, yeah and then it, it, just going back to what you're saying about the, the Hadopi uh, article and the agency what they're trying to do I mean to be honest it sounds like they're 
the most effective ones, if you like, kind of more effective than this law in Sweden. It certainly sounds like what they're trying to do is, you know, stands a chance of being more effective than than these, you know, like Sarah was saying, yeah. four warnings and then we'll call your mum type approach in the UK. Um, it's amazing as re- well. It's like, wow, how do people see the light? What's going yeah. on? <laughs> <laughs> but read, reading the article that you're saying, you know, if uh, if you could order a takedown notice, it actually was also a stay down notice like Martin Mills was, was touching on in his speech. You know, it still says you know, these kinds of orders could be valid for up to six months, you know, but then not it's still not for any longer than that. Um, and then it says it's also that would only be initially be applicable to sites that are hosting files and not links to files. So, you know, BitTorrent indexes or something like that. Uh, you know, you know, the, the end of the, the report says um, these are all responses gradually leading to establishment of an effective action against websites taking advantage of a massive operation of counterfeiting. I mean, you know, you just read that paragraph and think, oh, you know, that just sounds like such a load of fluff, to be honest. I mean, it, it's just like, oh, these are all gradually leading to some effective action of some kind, but we don't really know what. I mean, you know, could, could you really get more of a fudge? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's clearly a very delicate and very difficult situation and you know of course if it wasn't so difficult someone would have found a solution by now but um, <laughs> you know I just don't feel like any of these agencies are really producing any effective action whatsoever at the moment um, and I want to actually touch on something that, that Darren again raised uh, excellently in the digest a few days ago which was um, that Duncan Gear um, had sent him an article about the availability of content because Martin Mills was kind of saying, you know, uh, Google said that it's an availability issue and a pricing issue, and I think that's absolute rubbish. Um, you know, it might have been true 10 years ago or whatever, but, you know, today you just can't really get away with that statement. Um, and then um, the article that, that, that Duncan sent was actually kind of suggesting that, in fact, perhaps availability, you know, and pricing is still a big issue and more of an issue than you might think. Um, I mean, I definitely think it is, you know, just to bring it back to Game of Thrones, sorry, not that I'm obsessed or a mad fan or anything, but, you know, I mean... It's ridiculous. There was that excellent cartoon on what was it, the oatmeal or the onion or something. Uh, I think it was last year, just showing how no matter how hard you tried to legally get your hands on the latest episode of Game of Thrones, you just can't do it. You know, they don't even bring out the DVDs of the show until, you know, a year after the previous season has aired. I mean, it's madness. It's complete madness. You know, I think music streaming services are getting better in this respect, but I think the film industry and the TV industry is still have an awful long way to go um, in terms of, you know, sorting out the availability and pricing and, you know, why don't you just make Game of Thrones available worldwide, you know, the, uh, as soon as it airs, you know, and then people can subscribe to the service, they can watch it straight away, they won't feel the need to go to the Pirate Bay or whatever it is they use to, to download the, uh, episodes illegally. You know, I would pay more for a legal streaming subscription service on a monthly basis if I knew that I would be able to have all of the content that I wanted to. Yeah. Um, and I'm still constantly frustrated every time I go on Netflix or something similar. You know, almost every time I look for a show or a movie or whatever I want, it's not there. Um, you know, it is very, very frustrating. So, you know, I think Martin Mills is right that it's not enough for Google or YouTube to just say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's a bit of an availability problem or whatever. But it is still an issue, a big issue, yeah. and particularly for, for film and TV. And, and you know, the studios and, and the the pub- music publishers never, you know, people have got to wake up to this. We've got, we've got to sort it out, you know, digital copyright, just, you know, it's still analog, really. We're still stuck in, a, in an analog age, yeah. I feel, <laughs> you know, um, 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 you know, we've got to bring things up to date and get into the 21st century. And unfortunately, yeah, it's, it's always the highest bidder uh, thing, right? So if, if the producers of Game of Thrones know that they're going to get uh, X amount of million from cable networks to broadcast yeah. it and keep it windowed and keep it closed then they're going to keep doing that just as uh, Beyonce has released the album just on iTunes and it's not available anywhere else uh, it's kind of in a sense it's you know who pays the most and who can you get the most money from uh, which is uh, yeah. uh, I mean and that's what they think I guess because that's a safe bet but mm. because you know nobody of a certain stature has actually tried to do what you were suggesting Lucy which is uh, actually mm. going out there and saying well actually we're going to make it available worldwide and see 
who pays yeah. what and what happens is it's just uh, too big of a risk for them right now uh, yeah which i understand but yeah you know on as playing devil's advocate you have to wonder how much more could you potentially stand to earn if if yeah. you did make it available you know absolutely anyway Absolutely. And uh, um, I wanted to uh, close. Well, there's a couple of things that I want to touch upon, but uh, let me choose one. Uh, I guess I'm going to finish by talking about uh, this story that came out uh, on Music Ally uh, this morning, which was the fact that uh, Spotify uh, was in talks with CBS to acquire Last FM before it made a bid for the Econest. I mean, this kind of doesn't come like a, a, as a real surprise to any of us. Uh, and also, you know, the fact that the price was deemed to high by Spotify comes as no surprise as well because uh, CBS acquired Last FM in 2007 for $280 million <coughs> and I would imagine they would have been pretty upset if they'd been offered uh, uh, the same as the Econest so uh, the rumored uh, $100 million, but mostly in, in, in uh, you know, virtual Spotify uh, stock instead of actual cash you know it would have been a pretty big uh, you know, write-off for, uh, uh, for them to take for CBS to take in the sale of uh, uh, Last FM so uh, clearly that would have been a great fit for everybody involved it would have been a great sale but it didn't happen so uh, now what's what next for last fm and, and who do you think might be interested in buying the company uh darren what's next for last fm honestly uh, a slow dwindling horrible ignominious death that's what last fm's got rolled up i'm sure unless someone comes and bails them out and i'll say the same thing i say every time when this topic comes up you know last fm is full of extremely clever savvy brilliant people it's just owned by the wrong company, yeah. you know, and um, it's very sad, I think, that Last FM may well find itself as a, as a sort of case study in history of, you know, uh, what happens when a tech company is bought out by a, you know, a, a sort of multi, uh, well, just a large corporate entity who only sees the short term gain in the in the in the ad revenue and i think really that's that's the thing is last fm's just being kind of bled dry as an advertising cash cow in the same manner as myspace was mm. um and at some point it will just die yeah. and, you know and particularly now that spotify has excuse me bought echo nest and everything else it's you know it's going to dwindle in relevance and you know i mean i i said all this before when uh Last FM kind of announced they were turning off the streaming side of their product or whatever it was they were doing. And, and it's quite funny because whenever I give Last FM or specifically CBS quite a sound kicking, um, you get a sort of combination of former Last FM employees emailing me going, right on! And current Last FM employees going, it's a bit harsh. Uh, <laughs> you know, though not necessarily disagreeing with me quite tellingly. So uh, yeah. I just. It, it, more than anything, you know, for all the bile and, and sort of uh, anger that I've directed CBS's way, uh, more than anything, I just feel terribly sad yeah. for the people that are there. Um, mm. and, and, and indeed the people that are no longer there. But, uh, you know, at one point, Last FM was full of really sharp people who mm. could have just done so much with it. Um, you know, it, you know, the well it's probably public knowledge but you know there was talk of me going there at one point and i wanted to go there because the um you know the the, the team there were fantastic uh, i'm not a disgruntled didn't get the job guy by the way it's fine it was kind of like it was one of them things but uh yeah i just i just find it incredibly sad i mean i suppose the precursor to the the cbs last fm thing was sort of yahoo and Flickr, maybe yeah but and eventually yahoo kind of got their finger out and turned flick around when i think Yahoo realized that they had to buy lots of other companies to, to exist. And, and a bit like Facebook's doing now, I think they're realizing that maybe the future lies in a kind of uh, an ecosystem of, you know, separate services rather than one big service to, to swallow the globe. And um, a CBS was know, never desperate. No, and I, and I think that's the other problem is CBS probably don't really look at Last FM as something they need to take action on. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I don't think they're sat there thinking... Christ, we're Ooh. losing money hand over fist. What can we get rid of to, to shore up things or anything else? So it's just sort of owned by this very wealthy company that it just feels like they don't really care. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a very unloved entity at the moment. And you know, as I said, more than anything, um, it, I, I just find that very, very sad. I mean, I heard whispers at one point that there was talk of like people trying to almost, you know, affect a, a, a people's buyout of Last FM. 
And I did hear the numbers going around on that, and I'm not going to divulge them because <laughs> someone could probably sue me, but uh, they, they sure as hell weren't high, and they sure as hell weren't what Spotify paid for the Echo Nest. Yeah. So um, who we'll knows? See. But who knows? What, what a way to go, you know? It's just sad. I yeah. feel just horribly sad about the whole thing cbs yeah. took an amazingly good thing and fucking ruined it i know but at the same time it's, it's one of those things you know at, at the time when it happened 2007 there was still probably a notion that cbs would turn around and become this sort of media conglomerate that was going to be all funky and sort of take you know take from last fm and sort of shape the company around that or something like that i don't, I don't know what they were thinking but uh, it's a bit like when vivendi bought mp3.com for 200 and it was 260 million back in 2003 uh, you know it was it's crazy deals um, and <laughs> yeah there were strange times that's for sure yeah, you know? and, and, but that's the other thing isn't it it's sort of they were bought at that peak sell point and then everything kind of fell apart yeah thereafter you know and, exactly. and but cbs aren't an innovator you know they don't do very interesting things across the board they're quite safe they're quite old mm -hmm. school in the other stuff they own and you know yeah i just uh yeah, I mean, I'd be interested to read the, the, the Music Ally article because obviously the, the piece that's on their website today is, is kind of an excerpt yeah, from a, a longer, a longer piece, yeah, yeah. Um, piece that I'm really keen to read just because it, it does sort of ask the question, you know, what, what, what could Last FM have been, where were the opportunities and kind of what happened, you know. And I mean, I suppose we know what happened in the mm -hmm. sense of CBS buying it and letting it sort of slowly uh, fade um, yeah. from view. But, and uh, Lucy... Yeah. Lucy, are you, are you like me that are sort of slightly worried about all the data that they have about my music consumption and what's going to happen to it? Well, I've actually never really been a big Last FM user, so I'm right. fine. <laughs> I don't know about fine. you. No problem. <laughs> Excellent. But I'm, I'm all right. good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and from so your, that's the good news for today. <laughs> and from your side, who do you think, because we haven't really seen another service come in and do exactly what they do quite as well as they do. So, so Lucy, do you think there is a need of somebody to be tracking what you're doing online? Uh, for the, with your music or are we at the point where this is no longer necessary I don't know I mean I don't know if anyone could, could do what they do as, as well as they have done uh, you know and I, I don't know if that is strictly necessary now um, I think you know it's probably more necessary for services like Spotify to buy services like Echo Nest you know so that they can just sort of pump up their their data really and, and get as much visibility and data on, on users listening and habits and use that to drive activation and growth as, as much as they can yeah really I mean I just in all honesty I've never felt the need personally to use Lost FM and to to you know have all my listens scrubbled and whatever to be honest I, I'm not sure why that is it just yeah, it, it's, it's never thing, been a service right? yeah. that, that's actually felt like it needed a place in my life, to be honest. <laughs> and, and yeah, I, I have to say, I don't, you know, with the way that, you know, music technology is evolving now, I don't know that there will ever be another another time and place for a, for a service quite like Last FM. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's interesting to me because I think Last FM never. Uh, quite fulfilled on its prospect, which was that, you know, it should have been the equivalent of Facebook Connect. There should have been a, a Last FM Connect that could have plugged in and tailored your uh, experience around music on the internet in that it could have, you know, ensured that you visit the NME and only see stories about bands that, you know, are generally in your musical graph, if you like, and things like that. You know, and same with apps and, and everything else. It it could have turned into something monumental, but was never uh, really given that opportunity. Um, yeah. And it, I mean, and another angle, I have to say that as a guy running a marketing company, is like Last FM still is a phenomenal source for advertisers to find uh, connected mm -hmm. artists. You know, if I want to do an ad campaign around my bands, looking at Last FM's data as regards, you know, if person listens to band X. What other bands do they listen to? Last mm. FM's got an absolutely insane amount of insight on that. Um, and for years, it was like, you know, me and, and about three other ad agencies I knew were just bleeding that bloody API dry for this stuff because you could go feed it one band. And it, what it gave you back wasn't an opinion because when you're doing advertising and you go to any band and say, who do you sound like? The answer you get back is usually not particularly 
similar to the reality of it because they're just they're just too close you know they see it differently whereas last fm was the reality of it and sometimes that didn't give you a fashionable answer you know it turns out that half your fans also listen to keen and coldplay but that was the fact of it so if you targeted keen and coldplay fans telling them about this release you might you know get a good response and you know that that kind of insight given that last fm was a was a separate entity and wasn't just bundled in with spotify or whatever um you know will be lost if last fm disappears and i think yeah. that you know that kind of insight is also going to be a real shame to lose but ultimately i think these things are, are just kind of the ebb and flow of trend you know and we probably will reach a point where they'll just you know these sorts of things will get bundled in and then in five years someone will come along with something that basically looks extremely like last fm but just looks nicer feels a bit better it's all a bit more minimal and clean and, and everything else and people will probably be all over it in the same manner that you know, peel back 10 years and someone launched Napster going, well, you can rent your music and stream it when you like, but you don't own it. And everyone was affronted and no one used it. And then Spotify comes along and everyone's yeah. like, wow, who knew you can rent music and you don't, you know. So all these things just go full circle. And I'm sure at some point, a service akin to Last FM may yet prove its value but right here unless and now. Uh, unless spotify take over the world with their platform play and then everywhere you go on the internet you're going to have spotify plays buttons which is a little well, scary yes, but as, it's a little as scary, we touched but... on earlier it's kind of like <laughs> you know spotify's place in the world is is dominant for now yeah but is exactly. no by no means unassailable because if apple had wanted to buy it you know uh the the rumor was that you know with a f- probably 12 to 15 billion they could have probably easily sold a comp sold that uh, bought spotify which is actually only about 10 percent of apple's cash reserves so if they had wanted to make that move they could have made that move uh, mm-hmm. and we'll see if anybody else decides to to make it or <laughs> go that way that would be quite fun uh, but uh, be an ipo from what <laughs> i understand the my sources andrea nudge wink i have sources they they told me that uh daniel Eck would uh, would kind of rather die than just sell the company, sell the company. yeah yeah that, mm. that's, 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 that's what it feels like yeah exactly and we we're talking a, a couple of weeks ago when uh, uh deezer's ceo said he was going to step down in september about the fact that it's a very different type of ceo because of course he didn't found deezer and whilst daniel Eck is very very much uh, uh close to uh to uh, like at heart uh to yeah. spotify mm. and uh and i just wanted to finish uh, guys uh, thanks so much for your time and i I know we've run over a little bit, so I just wanted to do a quick roundup of the, the short and brief news. So uh, the Gramophone project uh, has uh, reached its goal on Kickstarter. It's going to end in a few hours and uh, closing in on about $300,000 with uh, 4,500 people pledging for uh, some sort of device uh, from them. So we'll, we'll see how that uh, works and hopefully I'll have a, a demo unit in a few weeks uh, to show you. Uh, I was one of the first people to, one of the first 400 to pledge for it. So hopefully I'll have a review unit that I can. What's that unit? What does it do? Uh, the gramophone. It's a bit like a Sonos without speakers, in a sense. Mm-hmm. That's. I think that's that's a concept. Is it that sort of rock-looking one? There's no. one that looks a bit like a sort of. No, it looks like an Apple TV, essentially, a little bit. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, that so that's that's nice. that's the one made by the Phone. Uh, so it's essentially it's a Phone router plus a music streaming. Uh, device on top of that and uh, on top of that uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that Spotify uh, overhauled its Windows phone app so if you are on Windows phones the millions of you I can see my stats that there's about probably five people that use Windows phones in the DMT listening (laughs) community but if you are uh, then you can go and get uh, that but it's only for premium subscribers so that's a bit of a shame and uh, (coughs) excuse me and finally Sonos has released its 5.0 app for iOS uh, which brings uh, uh, Google Play uh, Google Play Music, Beats Music, MBL, Shuffler, FM in the fold, as well as a, a bunch of new features, including universal search and an alarm clock, which you can uh, choose a track from any service and it's going to wake you up in the morning. So that's pretty cool. And that's pretty much all for this week. So Lucy, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. It was a real pleasure having you on. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. It was great to be back and great fun as always. Uh, thanks so much. And uh, thanks, Darren, again. It was a, a pleasure as always. Thanks. Sorry about the swearing. (laughs) Don't worry about that. We had some swearing at the panel last week as well. And thanks so much for listening to the show this week. And uh, you can find everything on digitalmusictrends.com. Subscribe to the newsletter. You can do all sorts of of things. You can subscribe to the actual podcast on a podcast app, which is probably the easiest way to get hold of it every week. And uh, follow us on Twitter on at Digimusictrends. I really hope you have a fantastic week. And uh, until next time.